I am excited we're going to get right into this because um, we got a dog. <laughs> we got a dog. Uh, I, I, my, my pursuit for a dog, my, uh, my dreams, and, and, you know, we dreamt of getting a dog for years and years. And after getting married, I thought I was very close to getting a dog. That was a lie because instead of getting a dog, we kept having babies. And the deal was... Once the last baby is out of diaper, we can get a dog. And then we, it just like 10 years later, we never got a dog. But thanks to COVID, uh, the Lord has uh, healed April for some spirit. She's got some deep spiritual stuff in her. And she finally caved in. And she said these words. She said, it might not be a bad idea to get a dog. <laughs> now... This is what I learned in marriage counseling, right? I have to pick on certain words and adjectives. And this is, I'm going to give you an insight of what my life is, right? When she said it might not be a bad idea, the Greek translation of that sentence was, we need to get a dog. Let's get a dog now. We're ready. Let's do it. So uh, thanks to a, f yeah, this guy knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> Uh, so thanks to a friend of mine, um, we got referred to a breeder and then we just jumped right into it. We put an application and we waited and waited and waited and we waited and then up jumped this puppy on the available dogs list. And what that was is really the puppies that were ready to go home and um, people backed out the last minute. Uh, so it's basically the dog's reject list, right? And I, I didn't care. It wasn't the breed I dreamt of. It wasn't even the size. It wasn't even the color. But I jumped that thing, man. Like, I wanted that dog. So filled up the application for that dog. Like, literally two and a half seconds later, we got accepted. So two days later, I dropped everything. And I went to get Charlie home. Yes, we're big fans of Charles Spurgeon in the house. So do we have pictures of Charlie? I think we got pictures of Charlie. Aww. I knew you would say that. <laughs> you got one more picture of Charlie. That's with a male. And he's like, why are you waking me up, Dad? I'm not ready to get up. All right, we got one more picture. That's him, right? That's with Vivi. That's my three-year-old. She'll get handy towards the end of the service. Remember Vivi. She's so cute. Isn't he perfect? He's not perfect because he still pees and poops on the floor. And he's chewing up everything. And you know what? Our floors have never been this cleaned because we're just sanitizing constantly. We're cleaning and sanitizing the floor constantly. It's a blessing. <laughs> All right. So uh, I titled today's message, Object of Pursuit. And I want to get the narrative straight. It's not about me chasing after getting a dog. It's not about Charlie. Charlie can take a can take a seat for now, but it's all about Jesus, and I want to talk about Jesus. You guys ready to hear about Jesus? Yeah, let's do it. And I want to talk about him specifically being the one that initiated long ago the pursuit to restore God's initial, initial plan for his people. Uh, the fact that we need to rest, whether you're here as a non-believer, or you've known Jesus for a long time, or this is your first time here. There's nothing you can do that can change God's strategy or God's plan. I want you to rest on the assurance that there's nothing you can do that can change that. Even though if, you're, if you feel like your Christian life or Christian walk is stagnant. Okay? I'm going to challenge you with that today. So God is pursuing his people despite people right? He's pursuing us despite us, despite how dirty we think we are, despite how bad we think we are, despite how lost we think we are. We call that the good news of the gospel. And I'm passionate about this stuff because, man, I've just seen the gospel of Jesus Christ change my life. This is not the guy that you're looking at right now. This is not the guy that I was back 15 years ago. So if you have your Bible handy, I want you to turn into 1 Timothy, the first chapter. We're going to focus on verses 12 to 17. And if that sounds familiar, if you were here on first Tuesday service, who was here on first Tuesday service? Raise your hand. Yeah, it's pretty good. Wasn't that great? 
Wasn't that awesome? I see a lot of nods. Yeah, it was powerful. I was actually watching online, getting ready for the message, and I hear Pastor Tim share from 1 Timothy 1st chapter, verses 12 and 17. And I looked at April, and I was like, oh no, he's about to preach my sermon. What am I going to do? But it was actually a good thing. You know what that just tells me? This is how God sometimes speaks to us. So I'm going to tackle a whole different angle. Uh, Tim didn't know I was preaching from this, actually, by the way. So God gave it to me first. I'm claiming that. <laughs> uh, he did not know I was preaching from this. And, um, and so I'm excited to see what God has in store for all of us here this morning. All right? So let's all stand up, guys. And we're going to honor the reading of God's Word by standing up and follow on. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 and 17. It goes like this. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and an insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed. Everybody say overflowed. For me, with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save, to save who? To save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Some translation will say, of whom I am the chief of sinners. But I received mercy for this reason. That in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him. For eternal life to the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you, Lord, for your presence here. And Lord... Uh, I can't wait to see what you're about to do with today's word, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would help me get out of your way so that you will speak to your people. Lord, I just pray that everyone's heart will soften up to, the, to your word, to your nudging, and to your pursuit, Jesus. I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Please have a seat. God bless you. So let's give a little bit of a context for 1 Timothy uh, pretty quickly here. This is the first of two letters that the Apostle Paul uh, wrote to Timothy, his protege. And by this time, Timothy is the pastor of the church in Ephesus. It's actually a pretty big deal. So just uh, Paul was a good church planter. He would go to a region, bring his buddies, go to a region. Sometimes he doesn't bring anybody. He just go to a region. He would uh, preach the gospel. People get saved. He trains people. He raised them up. He appoints them on the church. And then he leaves and goes on to the next region. He doesn't stay content with just setting up a church. This is why we went to Apollo Beach. This is why we're going to Fall River. This is why Brandon is going to Guatemala. This is why pretty soon we're going to Peru. We're not content because God wants everybody to know him. So pretty quickly, Paul goes on and starts to talk to Timothy about this false teachers, people who claim to know the law. And the sad part is, and he's warning him, the sad part is these false teachers have infiltrated the church. You know, if we can tell from... Uh, Acts 19, that uh, Paul spent about two years in Ephesus. So he's got a good spiritual pulse on what's going on in that city. What makes that city ticks? What are the idols? What are their, their ideologies and all that? He's got a pretty good idea. So Paul doesn't back out just a, as a good shepherd would do. He warns Timothy and he tells him, listen, be careful. People are infiltrating the church because they're, they're, and they are distorting the power of the gospel, the simplicity, the simplicity of the gospel. So my aim today is not, is, is different. My aim, I'm going to go at this passage from this angle. This particularly that God is pursuing us despite us. 
So why does God pursue it if you were to ask? Why does God pursue us? I mean, he, he's got it all. Well, why does he need me? Why, what's so different about me? Um, well, he's pursuing you. If you follow on the notes, you can go to waterschurch.guide and click on today's message and follow along on the notes. We have bulletins as well. And if you're watching online, you can click on the note tabs. And if you're not taking notes, please take notes. So why does God pursue us? He's pursuing us because His greatest desire is for a relationship with you. Not because of what you've done, anything that you've done, but because of who He is. Uh, Tim Keller famously said this. He said, the Bible is the story of God pursuing His wayward spouse. You know, we're all pursuing something. And in every stage of your life, you've pursued something or you've pursued someone. And I want you right now, take a three second mental uh, uh, a break and think of the things that you're pursuing now. Do that. One, two, three. We all are pursuing something. And I'm pitching here the idea that the, the, the Bible's idea that you can pursue anything you want except when it comes to God. God does all the pursuing long ago and actually he talks about it. He says before the foundation, before you even born, before he created this world, he was pursuing it as his art. Now I know that the idea of Jesus pursuing his bride might be a tough pill to swallow for all the dudes in the house. Raise your hand if you feel uncomfortable with that, right? Uh, the idea of Jesus pursuing his bride, right? It's just like a little bit uncomfortable. Like, dude, I'm, I'm a guy. I'm like, what are you talking about? All right, I want you to relax. It's a figure of a speech. Uh, nobody's going to ask you to put on makeup and wear a wedding dress. We're just not that kind of church, all right? We don't do that. It's a figure of speech. But what I'm trying to say is that if you're here today and you're a believer in Jesus, but life has, your, your walk with Christ has been stagnant, right? It's getting boring. You're not seeing much of things. You're not participating in, in, in things. Or you've been, you're here for the first time, or you're not interested in Jesus. Somebody dragged you here because it's the thing to do on Sunday and let's go to church before the snowstorm comes. Let's go to church and get ready to the Super Bowl later. You're watching online because you've heard on Tuesday, Pastor Tim said that there's a Muslim guy speaking at church. Come check him out. Right. Well, let's talk about the Muslim thing, right? I, I want to talk about it very quickly. I'm not going to go over it, but I want to talk about it because I, I came here last weekend during second service for the first time on a Sunday in two months because I was hanging out with the awesome people in Woonsocket campus. And God is doing amazing things there. It was just awesome to be there and, and just partner with them. But I came here for second service and the church was packed. And I didn't know anybody. So the only person I knew was our elder, Felix, was sitting in the back. So I just sat next to him and, and halfway through the message, I leaned over and I said, Felix, who are these people? I kind of looked all around the back. I didn't recognize a single soul. That's a good thing. Because in two months, we had like a whole new church sitting in the back. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it's exciting. That stuff excites me, man. We, that means we're doing something right. We're sticking to preaching the gospel no matter what the Word tells us. Amen? Yes. All right, let's get back to Paul. <laughs> All right. No, not Paul. Me. <laughs> uh, I wasn't always a believer in Jesus, you know. I, I, and I didn't just try Christianity because I was in a, a phase of my life. Uh, uh, at least that's what some of my close friends and family thought I was doing. And they're like, oh, you know, he's just being rebellious. You know, he'll come to his senses and, you know, and just come back and be a good Muslim just like he was. I was actually, you know, I did come to my senses. I did. And I was accused. So for that, I was accused of betraying my religion and betraying my family. See, uh, leaving Islam was not easy. Because you just, you leave more than just a religion. Uh, I thought, I thought what that, you know, I thought I knew what that meant 15 years ago when I made, made that decision. I didn't realize what would that mean now for my kids and my wife. 
So it wasn't easy, but I'm going to argue that it wasn't hard either. It was not hard because just like Saul of Tarsus, and here's why. Just like Saul of Tarsus, when he was a good Pharisee and he thought he was doing the right thing by chasing after the believers. So on the road to Damascus, he got interrupted by Jesus, the risen Christ. And he tells him, Paul, Paul, uh, Saul, Saul, why are you perse uh, persecuting me? This guy was so zealous, was such a good Pharisee that he went on to arrest people and bring them to justice. He went on and dragged people out of their houses for the cause of God. See, I once, just like Saul, I once was blind to Christ and I was following the teachings, all right? The teachings of a, of a dead prophet and a distant God. And it's a huge emphasis there with the small g God. You know, my, my pursuit uh, consisted of uh, trying to please after both of them, trying to earn brownie points with both of them, trying to uh, work so hard to stockpile as many good deeds as I can. Because as a, as a Muslim, you're never too sure if you have just enough to make it through paradise. So I was, that's my pursuit. I was just pursuing, slaving after, being good, doing the good thing, pray, face Mecca, and pray five times a day and sometimes more. But Jesus in His grace and in His mercy has interrupted my life. The pursuit was over. And for the first time in my life, instead of running away from Him, I did the craziest idea. Guess what I did? I stopped. And I give, I open the door to the slim possibility that what if this Jesus thing is real, right? So you got to be careful. J Muslims believe in Jesus too. And he, they believe that he's coming back too. They believe that he didn't, he, 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 he never went to the cross. They believe that he didn't die. So we got to be careful of which Jesus we're talking about here. And I'm talking about the Jesus on this book. Because it's so different. It might sound, look or sound familiar to the Muslim Jesus. Whew, it's very different. So I open the door to that possibility that is Jesus real? Is Jesus is who he said he is in the Bible? And I had to do the craziest idea. I had to open the door to learning for, about Jesus from a perspective of a Christian. Not the perspective that I grew up on. So my favorite thing to say is I once was a Muslim, but now I see. Because when Jesus reveals himself to you through his word and through his people and through the preaching, clear preaching of the gospel, the scales came off of me. And now my life is <laughs> different. Man, you should have known me like 15 years ago. I was a different dude. So guys, God is on the move. And I thought I was special when God did this to me, when God revealed himself to me and he rescued me. I thought I, thought I was special. I thought I was unique. But I quickly find out that Jesus is doing things with thousands and thousands of Muslim, Muslims all across the world. And sometimes in the most hostile places for Christianity. So that's why, just to give you a perspective on the big picture guys here, your tithes go to global missions that spread the word about Jesus. Your tithes money go out of this house to support the preaching of the gospel, to support having people, getting the chance for people to have Bibles in their own language. You got to see the big picture, girl. It's not about you. If you think this church is about you, you are in the wrong church. It's not about you. It's about other people. And guess what? God used you to reach other people in Jesus' name. Amen? So let's get back to Timothy because I got excited about this stuff and I don't, I have 14 minutes left. <laughs> so what do I mean by Paul is the prototype of the result of the gospel if you follow on the notes with me? You know, the prototype, being you know, like an example of the gospel. This is what happened when your life is changed by the gospel. You know, he was a great sinner and he knows it. He talks about it. He never got, got over the fact that he persecuted believers who believed Jesus was the promised Messiah. You know, 1 Corinthians 59 tells us, this is Paul speaking. 
for I am the least of the apostles and were and worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God you know sometimes we're so entrenched in our traditions uh, we're not willing to move beyond them to acknowledge the truth you know this is what we do we say you know I'm a Catholic man like I'm a Catholic some like I'm a, oh, I'm a Muslim like what are you talking about some of you are saying, you know, I went to an Ivy League school. I'm an intellectual. Some of you are saying, you know, I'm a hot mess. What are you talking about? Like, why is this pursuit thing? You know, some of you are saying, you know, I am what my family says I am. And we're missing out on Jesus, the one who created us, for something much better than that. We're blind to his pursuit of us because of our own definitions of who we are. But he comes after us anyway. And I'm glad for that because he does not let what you think stop his heart, where his heart is. And he knows exactly what it would take to reach us. So how does God pursue us? If you follow along, letter A. So how does God pursue us? Verse 13, verse 13 says, Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent, a violent man, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. What is he saying there? He created, he knows you, he knew who Paul was. He did all those things, blasphemer, persecutor, violent man. Number one, he knows you. It, well, Ephesians uh, 1.4 says this, even as he chose us in him, in Jesus, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. See, for example, take a look at my kids. I got four of them. I've watched them grow since day one. I know how to uh, communicate my love and care to each one of them. Uh, each one of them is unique and I know how to make each one of them tick. Uh, one of them, is a, we call her the professor. She just wants reasons and explanations behind everything. And you know that gets boring pretty quickly. That gets really annoying. And one of them is a performer, right? And all she desires is my participation as her audience. All she, just, all she wants is me just sit her, watch her show, like her, watch her perform for me. That's how she best received my love and kiss. Like, Daddy, thank you so much. I feel loved and cared by you. Uh, the other two, I'm still trying to figure them. One of them, the baby, the 18, 19 month old, she's a criminal. <laughs> and it's not fair, guys, that toddlers get away with so much stuff. They, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm advocating for their arrest. They gotta be fixed. This is crazy, the stuff that they get away with. Like pulling Charlie's tail all across the house. That's not something we do that. Number two, he gives grace and mercy. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The first time, if you pay attention, he talked about mercy. He talked about the mercy he's got. The second time, listen to this. The second time he talks about mercy, it wasn't just meant for him. We're not meant to just keep it to ourselves. It's meant to go to other people and touch other people. In receiving the gift of mercy, we get filled up and we allow Him to do work in us and eventually let it pour out and overflow to other peoples because that's the way they see Jesus in us. You might be the only Bible that somebody will ever open. You might be the only Christian that some... Man, I, I used to work in a restaurant. And uh, I remember when I, came, when I was excited about searching the faith and, and I, I talked to, you know, the, the bartenders and, and the waitresses and the waiters in my restaurant. And I said, you know, I started going to this church, man. It is awesome. They opened the Bible and they, I just ripped my Bible. They opened the Bible and they preach from the Bible word by word. And they say, they do what? I said, they preach from the Bible word by word. They, lay, they, they explain everything. They say, you need to run away. That's an occult. Run away. Literally, they were, that, they were, they wanted to take care of me. They thought they were protecting me. And little did I know, I was like a, 
I was just like, that doesn't sound right. I kind of like the stuff that they're talking about here. And I didn't realize that I was talking to people who maybe never stepped a foot at church and they call themselves Christians and maybe they come to church maybe once or twice a year. Psalm 145, 8, 9 says that the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and His mercy is over all that He has made. It's like the champagne, man. Like the champagne fountain. Some of you like, oh, like champagne. I like the sound of that. You know like the pyramid looking thing, the pyramid of glasses that sometimes you find it in weddings, right? So when you pour the champagne over the first cup and the first cup fills up and then overflows into the other cups and the other cups get filled and overflowed and to reach exponentially all the other cups. I see that and you know what I see? That's the exact picture of the kingdom of God. That's how God works, guys. It's not meant to be contained and feel comfortable with just our cup. Lord, I'm good. Thank you, Lord, for meeting me. I feel good right here, right now. No, it is not meant to be there. It is meant to reach other people. That's the only, I don't know if you know this, but that's the only way for Jesus to come back is for everybody get to hear about Jesus. Amen? We just have to be willing to receive and He will give us the capacity not only to pour out. How good is our God? How good is our God? Number three, He gives you faith to believe in Him. And that's the part that some of you guys are struggling with. If you follow along, number three, He gives you the faith. So even the faith to do that stuff, it's not something that you have to work on or earn or go to seminary or attend church to get it. He gives you that. Where do I get that from? Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace you have been saved. How many times you've heard that in this church? For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is what? It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. Here is the thing. We don't have the capacity to receive what He's given without Him. It all comes from Him. So rest on that. Just hearing that, that should take a lot of the load off of you. You know, He gives us the faith. We do not earn it. Uh, we could never do enough, uh, change enough, believe enough without Him. And I'm going to argue one thing for the longtime believers. That this is not a one-time deal and it's over. It is not. It is a continuous process. Because life gets hard. We face difficulties and hardships. And our tendency is to question whether we've been a good Christian or not. You know, I, I'm not a good Christian because I, I'm struggling and I'm still sinning. I'm still struggling with this thing. I'm not looking the Christian part that my friends are displaying over Facebook and Instagram. I, I'm, my life is not, does not look like that, guys. Let it be. We got to be careful. Let it be. When does God pursue us? When does He do that? Verse 15, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came to the world to save who? Sinners. Of whom I am the chief of sinners. Well, you might be saying, you know, that's all great, Mary. You know, like that God is pursuing me. Think it sounds good. But when will I see it? You have seen it. You just may not recognize it. There are, there are a couple of ways where we have, seen, we have seen God is pursuing you. You definitely have run away from God, right? Yeah, number one, we ran from Him. We ran from Him. And the perfect example I can think of is Jonah. Remember Jonah? God told him to go to Nineveh and preach the message. And he's like, God, those guys, those guys are wicked. Those are crazy. It's not going to happen. He jumps on a boat and he goes, he thought he made it. And God uses a stupid fish to bring Jonah back and say, I'm going to use you right here, right now. So Jonah, you know, like doesn't want to do this, but he still did it. He goes, he preached what God told him to preach. And guess what? They believe. And Jonah is grumbling because he said, I can't believe that they believed. God will still use you even though you're running away from him. Number two, we, when we sin against Him. Do you remember Genesis 3? Adam and Eve, they sin. 
This is the part where I want you to look at. Uh, uh, verse 9, it's not, on your, it's not on the screen. I'm going to read it for you. It says, But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. They sin. They both sin. First thing they do, they hid themselves. They sow fig leaves. They hid themselves. And God doesn't just sit there, look at them, and say, you know, you guys are messed up. I'm just going to like obliterate you. I'm going to start a whole new uh, family here. No. God initiates. God goes and says, Adam, where are you? That's the heart of God. He goes and he wants to restore things back to the original plan. Number three, when we rebel against him. Famous story about the prodigal son in Luke 15. Right, so he asked for God's for his uh, father's inheritance. He goes, he blows it off on girls and uh, strip clubs and all that. And then he realized he has nothing to eat. And he realized if he goes back to his father's house and work as uh, one of the servants, that he probably will have a better life. So uh, look at me at verse uh, 20 of Luke 15. It says that, and he arose, meaning. Um, the younger uh, son. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced and kissed his son. That's the God we serve. He doesn't sit here and say, well, I'm going to wait till he make it halfway through the road and I'm going to make him feel ashamed and embarrassed that he did all of that. No, the heart of God, he sees him and he ran and embraced him. And guess what he did? He tells everybody, put a, put a robe on him. Put a finger, uh, put a ring on his finger. And let's kill the fattened calf and celebrate because my son has come back. That's the God we serve. It's the God of who, who lead. He's not content with the 99 sheep, but he goes after the one sheep because the chances are you are that one sheep. And he goes and he comes you and he brings you to his fold. That's the God we serve. Let us see, what is our purpose? So after all of this, what is our response? What is our response to this God's pursuit? Well, it depends on us. It depends on us. Uh, number one, you could surrender to Jesus and receive God's mercy. Verse 16, but I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect what? Patience. God was patient with you, man. I don't know if you know this, but God was patient with you. And He's patient with other people too. And if you don't feel like you're ready to surrender, ask for the faith to, do, to receive it. We just talked about it earlier. A second Peter 3, 9. This is my favorite verse in the Bible. My favorite verse in the Bible. Second Peter 3, 9 says that the Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise as some count slowness. But is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. You know, God has been patient with you. He's been patient with people you think they're hard, it's hard to reach. He's been patient with the venomous co-worker. He's been patient with your neighbor. The last time in the snowstorm, he decided to plow his driveway and plow only uh, half of the dirt, ro dirt road closer to his driveway. So what that happened is that he, you, your driveway got blocked with heavy, wet, yucky snow. And then you had to come out and look on YouTube on how to snow blow heavy wet snow because you got a crappy snow blow so you had to whip out WD-40 and then and then spray the auger spray the blades spray the inside of the snow blower spray the chute so that the heavy wet snow doesn't get stuck right and he sees you hopping down the driveway with one leg because you busted your knee skiing for the first time as a stupid 39 year old person right and then he sees you clear all that up and you know that he's watching you from the window watching like look at that moron what he's doing, right? Does that sound familiar? Does that, does that, do I make that sound like a little personal? Yeah, God is patient with that neighbor too. You bet. So one way we could react, the second point, is we can give him praise. And I love what happened there in verse 17. Paul stops and just starts to break it in praise. You know, we call that a doxology. Uh, Mid-sentence, he just starts breaking out praises to God. You know, I love what Psalm 22, 3 says, and I'm, uh, it's on your screen in the King James versions, if you believe it or not. It says, by thou art holy, because I think it's beautiful. O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel, 
meaning in other words, inhabits the praises of your people. When we come here and worship and sing song, not about how good we are, but about how good God is, and we sing and we lift hands, and some of the crazy ones, they start dancing, and we just cry out and we sing. Do you know what the Bible tells us? That is a meeting place. It is no longer about your response and about what you do. God inhabits the praises of His people. So when you come here next time and just stand like this, waiting for the songs to finish so you can hear the guy talk, no, just come and take part of meeting God there before He meets you through the preaching of the Word. I challenge you to do that, guys. All right, sermon is sentence. God is pursuing you because His greatest desire is you, just as you are, and your yes is all He needs. Amen? I'm gonna tell you the story about my three-year-old Vivi, the one in the last picture. So Vivi got lice a couple weeks before Thanksgiving, and I knew uh, it was just a matter of time where everybody will get lice. So I am sorry if you're looking for lice treatment in Walgreens, Walmart, and CVS in North Arboro that couple weeks before Thanksgiving because I went and I bought them all because I knew it was just a matter of time. But here's the thing. I did not want to touch my kids. I didn't want to play with my kids. So day one, day two, week one, week two. And one day I... I was looking at something in the fridge and I closed the fridge and here's Vivi standing right in front of me. And you know what she says? She looks at me, she says, Dad, how come you're not holding me? How come you're not carrying me anymore? And my thought, this is what I said in my, because uh, this is what I said, didn't, didn't say it to her. I looked at her and I was like, you're the plague right now. If I touch you, this thing is over. There'll be lice all over my beard and my hair and I, I, I'm sorry, I like my beard and my hair. And I, in that moment, God spoke to me and said, this is what I do. I step in into the plague, I step in into the mess, and I embrace you. I am ready to lift you up out of that mess. 